Uh, okay. One thing, one thing that you can be assured of as, as the leader of this uh, organization is that we're always going to be advocating for our small farmers and our ability of our small farmers to create nutrient-rich, abundant food and do it and with resiliency to be able to do it again. And that's the kind of that's the kind of um, legislation we're going to move for. That's the kind of education we're going to move for, and the cooperation we're going to move towards. So, in that spirit, tonight we're offering a educational event for one of our board members here, Evan Ryan. So, please give it up for seed saving, Evan Ryan. Thank you, Tim Wolf. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so speaking of testicles, um, there's something that testicles and what we're going to talk about right now have in common, which is seeds. And specifically, we're going to talk about seed saving right now. And um, I'm a farmer here on the island, and um, you know, after, after maybe a few years of farming in, in my life, um, I suddenly learned about this intricate connection of seeds and actually growing food and the importance of it. So for me, seed saving um, really began as a hobby, and I, I still kind of consider myself a hobbyist, um, slightly an, an addict a little bit, so I'm constantly just grabbing seeds wherever I see them. If I've been to any of your farms, I'm just like grabbing seeds, and <laughs> some, some of them make it home. Um, this, this is um, in, our, in our living room, it just sits at... <laughs> The, the side table in the living room, I'm constantly just putting seeds there, and every now and then I'll forget, like, where, where, did, where did this splash come from? I don't remember, and then, and then I get rid of it because I don't know what it is, and I want to find what I don't know what it is. Um, but, you know, seed saving to me is really important, and, um, you know, I have, you know, half an hour to cover such a broad-based topic, and really, um, the main thing I want to share with you all is just how important it is to start saving seeds and start really cultivating the knowledge and passing it on so that more and more of us are saving seeds and sharing seeds with each other. Um, how many of you out there are, are growing, are, are saving seeds from your gardens, or your farm? Yeah, awesome. So there's some, some experience out there, and you know, it's definitely a trial and error process with myself, but um, you know, the first, first thing that comes up for me is, um, is why won't this work? Um, is, is why I'm saving seeds, you know, why, why we're saving seeds as a culture here. And, um, and this gets into what the importance of seeds are. The main reason that I'm personally saving seeds is for um, mainly a, a connection, an, an ancestral connection that's pretty, pretty deep in terms of, we have thousands of generations of information um, in seeds that have been passed on and cultivated for our benefit. Um, previous generations have done all this work for um, literally thousands of years so that, so that we could eat. And um, I also want to clarify that when I'm talking about seed saving right now for these purposes, I'm talking about annual seeds, which is the, you know, the, the annual vegetables that we eat, the more, more European-based vegetables or Southeast Asia-based vegetables, um, and not things like kala, which you know, have, have a seed that's ongoing in the ground um, that we can, we can store in that way, store in, in real life. But this is for yeah, things like beans and tomatoes and eggplants. And um, you know, the, the, this ancestral connection that we have with our past, which is our ancestors ate certain foods and liked them and adapted to them and cultivated them to do well in their climates, and then they passed them on to their offspring, who cultivated them more for their specific environment and passed them on. And most of us in this room, if not all of us, come from somewhere else initially, even the, the Hawaiians, the original Polynesians that landed in Hawaii, came from something else, somewhere else. And one thing that pretty much all of us have in common, our ancestors had in common, is that they carried seeds with them from place to place where they went because they really saw the importance and the value. And when they did that, they started planting seeds in new soils. So here we are in Hawaii planting seeds in, in new soils that come from somewhere else. And that seed from generation to generation is actually getting infused with the knowledge of the land um, and the ecosystem and the climate that we're in so that the next generation 
as, as it grows from generation to generation, is adapted to, to the proper environment that we're in. And we're at a point right now in the world that in the past, I, I think it's since 1900, um, we've lost about 95% of our varieties of vegetables. So 95% of this genetic coding that's been passed down from generation to generation has just been completely lost. Uh, and, and we can't really just get it back. And with that is certain adaptations or certain genetics that are no longer on this planet anymore. That, you know, it, it might be, it, how many of you are dealing with cabbage worms in your garden? Yeah, there, there might have been some genetics of a, of, of a kale or a brassica that was resistant to the cabbage worm that no longer exists now because 95% are gone. And what that, what that specifically looks like is, um, this is a little chart showing what, what varieties of different species existed um, in 1900 or how many. So we have cabbage right here. Um, there were 544 varieties of cabbage, and then th this is actually only current to 1983. But in 1983, that number got reduced to 28, from 544 varieties down to 28. And you can see this pattern with all of them, just in the width. 497 varieties of lettuce down to 36. So there's been a major loss of genetics, and there's, there's a major cost to it. Uh, in terms of just that genetic coding and disease resistance and fungal resistance, um, uh, variety, nutrition, nutritional variety as well. And while it, it paints a really bleak picture to, to see this kind of thing for me, um, one really inspiring fact that I really hold on to is, is the reality that what it takes to create a variety, let's say a variety of tomatoes, if I wanted to start creating a new variety of tomatoes, it take, it'll take me about six to 12 generations of planting to actually stabilize a new variety. So whereas in 1983, there were only 79 varieties of tomatoes, you know, maybe a, a tomato within three months, I could get tomatoes, so multiply that, let's say it's 10 generations, that's 30 months right there which is two and a half years, I could actually create a whole new variety. I could bring that number up to 80, or up, one up from whatever else, or whatever number it's at right now, and how many people are in the room, and how many are willing to take that task on, that j just in this room, let alone in our greater Hawaiian community, let alone in our greater uh, country community or world community. So we personally have the ability to take all these numbers and, bring, and restore them to this through proper seed saving techniques. Um, just by infusing our, our energy on that level. And it's a really powerful place for us to be in as a community. And you know, once upon a time in Hawaii, in the 1930s it was, there were about a, um, 100 seed companies in Hawaii alone. So you know, when we think about Monsanto or we think about other biotech companies coming into Hawaii, they're, just, they're following this pattern that once existed in basically an open market because this land wants to produce seeds and we haven't picked it up as a culture, as a generation, we haven't taken that on. So we went from 100 seed companies in the 1930s to UH sells some seeds, um, and that's about it as far as Hawaii seed growing like for, for market goes. So there's a tremendous opportunity in that. All right, so types of seeds that we're working with. Um, we have wild seeds, which is basically we go out into the wild and harvest seeds, and it's where most of our vegetables initially came from, was just some wild plant. Um, corn, for example, came from kind of a meager grass that had some seed that somebody, you know, somebody found, and they went out and they ate it, and they're like, oh, this, this kind of tastes good, and they took some seed from it and they planted it, and they started cultivating and loving and caring for it until suddenly we have corn, um, is what it is now. And all the varieties of vegetables that we're working with started out as some meager, um, these are a little plant, so I mean, not, not, to, not to insult the plant, but as far as the human nutritional desires and needs, it wasn't that exciting for it. Uh, and then we have heirloom varieties, which are basically they're just varieties of vegetables that have been cultivated long enough, or maybe over the past 100 to 150 years, that at this point they're, they're really stable, meaning that from generation to generation we plant their seeds, they, they grow what we expect them to grow, and they've been passed on from someone's great 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 grandfather to the great 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 grandfather to the great great grandfather, and it kept coming down for generations until now. Seed companies have picked up these varieties and started to grow them. Um, seed Savers Exchange. Uh, I just want to promote for a moment just that all 100% you 
heirloom seed varieties, organic, great place for seeds if you're not growing your own. Uh, open pollinated seeds, these are what most of us are probably planting, which are seeds that if we were to save, they would produce what we expect them to produce. And they're, they're relatively stable, not necessarily as old as heirlooms. Um, but we plant them, they go to seed, we plant their seed, they produce something that we expect. Hybrid seeds, are any of you growing hybrid seeds out there? So are, has, are you all familiar with hybrid seeds? Do you see seed packets that say hybrid on them? In the stores, it's really common, you can even get um, organic hybrid seeds. And hybrid seeds are a mixture of maybe taking a couple different open pollinated seeds and crossing them. And then what, what it produces is a whole new variety. And that whole new variety um, can be exciting for some people. So they'll cultivate that variety for seed. They'll plant the next generation of, of this cross between two parents. And they'll get this tomato that they really like. Uh, the cost of growing hybrids is that when you plant the next generation off of that seed, you don't know what you're going to get. Because suddenly you have two parents that came into one variety. And then the next generation is going to generally be a mix of those two parents, but not an even mix like it was in the first part. It's going to revert to some previous genetics, and we don't know what we're going to get. Sometimes with hybrids, the seed won't even reproduce. Um, so, so it's a challenging one to grow if you want to save your own seed. And then GMOs, um, we're not going to get into so much, but just blasting genetics into, into a plant. And so getting into sex with plants, we have flowers. And some flowers are bisexual and some flowers are um, unisexual. I'm not sure if it was monosexual. Um, so basically what that means is some of them have the male and female fla uh, organs within the same plant. And some just have one or the other. So this is a squash blossom right here. And if you've grown squash, sometimes you'll see flowers that come up and they have this little base, which is essentially the ovary, the ovule. Um, and that's the, the female fruit, essentially. It is the fruit. So when it gets pollinated by the male, you know, these are the testicles here of a flower, they'll go in there and they'll pollinate the ovary, we get a fruit. So if you've seen your squash plant, some of them look more like this, where they don't have the ovule, and some have the ovule. Um, and these are outbreeding plants, meaning they need other flowers to reproduce, and they need pollinators, either wind or insects or human. And then the, the perfect flowers, as they call them, um, are inbreeding, which means they, they generally self-pollinate even before opening sometimes. So like beans are an example of this. When, when you have bean plants, they produce true to seed most of the time, because before they even open, they've self-pollinated themselves. So there's not a lot of cross-pollination going on. <coughs> And then we get into maintaining purity on seeds, which is, for me as a farmer, it's really important. And I haven't participated in many seed exchanges here on Maui because we haven't had very many. And when I have, or when there's been seeds on the table here, I always want to know who grew them. Because I want to know whether they were maintaining purity of seeds so that if I'm going to plant a pepper that somebody brought, I'm going to get the pepper that they planted and not some other pepper because it cross-pollinated, or when it's a squash seed, I want to know that I'm going to get the right squash, because if someone's growing two varieties of squash within the same species and they cross, then I don't know what I'm going to get. So and as a farmer, I want to I want know, I'm going to get, know that I'm going to get what I want from what I plant. So when I go out and plant you know, 50 squash vines, that's going to be consistent and it's going to be marketable and people are going to want it. And so there's different techniques people do to um, basically isolate plants. Um, the main one I utilize is I plant one variety of squash per season, and I'm fortunate that you know my farm setup I've had a lot of space around so that I'm not going to cross pollinate with the neighbors. But if you're on a two acre lot, you're growing squash and your neighbors growing squash, then there's there's room for them to cross pollinate. Um, bagging is also something people do, or even taping the buds. Here's a a squash flower that they actually taped around. They hand pollinated and then they closed it up so nothing else would pollinate it so the seed wouldn't get contaminated. And there's all sorts of techniques, and time-wise, we're not going to get into them so much, but just knowing it's a, it's a very specific science, and we're going to get into some of the specific species we're working with. Um, population size and roving. What this means is that for every species, there's actually a very distinct population size in terms of furthering genetics. So if we, if we go out to the garden and we have 
you know, 20 heads of lettuce that were grown, let's say. And we want to save seed, so we eat 19 of them, and we save the little scrawny one that's there for seed because it's not, you know, it's not that abundant. It's not going to produce the biggest salad. Well, what's going to happen then is that one plant that we're saving seed from that's maybe a little bit scrawny is going to have inferior genetics. It probably has inferior genetics, which is why it's scrawny. It's probably not well adapted to the climate. Um, it's not super strong. So its offspring are also not going to be well adapted to the climate and not going to be super strong. So what we want to do is we actually want to rogue and, and basically select out some of our best fruits. And not just one or two of them, because when we do one or two, we're really limiting genetics, but actually have a distinct population size. So lettuce is an example. I'm not sure because I don't always remember this, but I think it's about 10 minimum, 10 heads of lettuce minimum you'd want to save lettuce from. And if you're a home grower, this isn't so likely because you only have you know, small plots. 10 heads of lettuce might be all you're planting, but if you're a farmer, you're going to do more. But really what the lesson teaches us is that if we're a home grower, let's stick with things that are smaller population size so we're not limiting genetics as a community. And, you know, and leave something that has a larger population size, like some things that might be 30 plants you have to have. Um, squash is a really great one, though, because if you have a good handful of plants, you can pull one squash from each plant. You can still get abundant squash without, without compromising the seed genetics. And then we get into harvesting seed and cleaning seed, which there's very different techniques with. There's two different main types of seed that I like to refer to. One is dry and the other is wet seed. So dry seed is Mo is most things. We'll get into the specific families, but wet seed is things like the nightshades, like tomatoes and peppers, and, um, and then the curcubits, like squash and zucchini. And you know, for seed cleaning for dry seeds, there's many different ways people do it to be effective. Um, one of the most fun ways is just bring people together and chuck beans, you know, sit on the porch and take dry beans and o open them up and collect seeds in that way and then share them. Um, if you want to get into to bigger scale, that's where people get into things like this, which, which is still you know, medium scale in terms of like the, the big, big companies. But one is screening. You, know, you could make little screens and just kind of shake the, the fiber and the seed mixture and have little holes that you know, only the seeds are going to fall through, which is still going to have a whole bunch of fiber because some fiber is going to be as small as the seed and all the bigger fiber is going to stay on top. Uh, and then you could you know, pour that onto another screen that the fiber falls through, but the seed stays on top. Um, or th this method, which, you know, this, this guy probably has, you know, a bin maybe around here and then another bin in front of that. And all the super fibrous stuff is going to fly really far and all the seeds are going to just drop into that, to the bucket right in front of them. And you might have to do that a few times to really get all the fiber out to clean it appropriately. Parts of the seeds. So seeds have, um, they have coats. And why do seeds have a coat? Uh, mostly just for protection. So, so there's this question of what do seeds need to germinate, which is you know, oxygen, sun, temperature, water, temperature, humidity um, with, with the water. So there's a, there's a formula related to seed saving, which is the temp air temperature combined with the humidity shouldn't exceed 100 for proper seed storing techniques. So what that means here in Hawaii, where we're you know, 70 to 80 degrees right now, and 70 to 80% humidity right now, we're way above. So we need to uh, create some better seed saving techniques to protect the coat on our seeds, you know, protect, protect this outer shell and keep it from getting soft and moist and losing its, its strength. And so what I do to save seeds personally is I like to put them in the fridge. And what that looks like for me is I will put them in the fridge open, maybe in a packet, and let them sit overnight. And what that does in, inside the fridge, it's a very dry environment and moisture wicking environment, is it really dries them out. And then the next day I'll open up the fridge and without really taking the seeds out, I'll put them in a jar and close the jar up and keep it in the fridge. And what that means when I want to take seeds out and plant them in my garden is you know, if you go in your fridge and you pull out, you, know, you pull out a cold beer or a cold drink, what happens to it? Condensation happens. Yeah, it gets soaked. You know, like you put that on your counter in our humidity, and just water starts dripping down the side. So if we take our seeds out of the fridge and we open up that jar, the same thing's going to happen to our seeds. They're just going to attract all this moisture to them, and that coat's going to get moist, uh, and it's going to affect the longevity and the vigor of the seeds. 
So we really want to um, take the seeds out in that jar or in the plastic bag or pepper where they have it in whatever it is and let it sit to come to room temperature before opening it up. This is perfect practices. Do I always do this? No. Like, oftentimes it's like I'm running out the door and it's time to plant beets and I go in the fridge, I pull out the beets, I open it up, I take out the packet and I go out to the garden and hope that I'm going to use them all. And if not, I'll put them right back in the fridge and it's okay. But what happens when we don't save seeds properly is it reduces the vigor. And the vigor is it uh, means a number of things. One is the germination rate, which when we purchase seeds, if you purchase seed packets from companies, most companies will sh share a date and they'll share a, a germination rate percentage on that package. And it might say, you know, like August 2012, 88%. And what that means is they tested these seeds in August of 2012 and 88% of them sprouted. Well, that means now here we are in April of 2013. By now, even in perfect conditions, that germination rate has been going down slowly. And then the time that it took to have them sent here, the time that we had them sitting in the garden and that sprinkle came down, or, or the time that we took them out of the fridge and opened it up, um, opened the container really quickly, and condensation happened on it. So that number is just kind of getting reduced through time. And not only is the germination rate affected, but even when a seed germinates, if the vigor is decreased, then that means the strength of it has decreased. So it's resistance to disease, or it's resistance to funguses, resistance to pests, has gone down through time. So seed storage, proper seed storage is really important. How are we doing on time? Great. Uh, so getting into some families of seeds, um, I. I based talking about the nightshade family, Solanaceae, in terms of wet, the, the wet seed saving processes. And in this family, Solanaceae, we have peppers, we have tomatoes, we have eggplants. Those are the three main varieties we're working with here. I know there's some cool farmers working with potatoes also. I don't have any experience saving seed from potatoes, so I can't speak to it. But these other ones, you know, these wet seed varieties, are pretty basic in that we wait for them to mature. And that's, that's the key to saving any seed, is the more mature, the better. Um, so what that means is if we have a pepper and it's still green in the garden, the seed's not really gonna be ready. And if we have an eggplant, and maybe it's a black beauty eggplant, which is this really deep purple, um, if we harvest it at that point, the seed's not gonna be mature. Because when you buy an eggplant from the store, you pull one from your garden and you eat it, you don't wanna be biting something really hard when you're biting on those seeds. So we let these mature so that that black beauty then becomes kind of gold, golden color, really overly mature on the plant. It's really infused with the genetics, and then we harvest it. We scrape out the seeds and process them. There's different techniques for doing that. With peppers, you could just kind of take it out with your hand, scrape it out. Eggplant, too, you can just scrape the seeds out with your finger, clean them off, dry them up, store them in the fridge. Tomatoes are an exceptional one in that they, um, really like fermentation, so um, require fermentation to, to be really good and, good and viable and store very well. And what that looks like is just basically cutting open a tomato and just squeezing the seeds into a jar with all that kind of juicy pulp on the inside and adding a little bit of water, letting it ferment for two, three days uh, just on the counter. And, um, and then cleaning it off and drying it out and storing it. And Solanaceae is a, this, this family, this nightshade family, is a perfect, has a perfect flower. So what that means is it self-pollinates itself. It's a really great one for saving seed for beginners because it doesn't cross-pollinate readily. So cross-pollination can happen, but for the most part, um, it takes care of itself. The, the flowers take care of itself. So it's a really, you know, level-wise, it's a beginner seed saving one. And most of the ones that we're going to look at right now are beginner ones. Um, squashes, same thing on saving seeds, cut, cut them open, scrape out the seed, wait till it's really mature. So what that looks like for you know, our winter squashes is, this to me is a little bit young, but I want, I'm going to let my squash get really golden on, on, on the plant itself. And sometimes I'll even take it off the plant and let it sit. You can let it sit for 20, 30 days and let that seed just really mature and really get defined by its climate before I cut open that save the seed from it. Squash ones are great because we can still eat the fruit. Cucumbers, not as much because you would want that cucumber to turn yellow. Like bright yellow, well, if it was a green cucumber, you'd want it to turn bright yellow and get overly mature before saving the seed, which means the fruit will get 
a little bit bitter. And then we get into all the other families, which are all dry seed that they produce. And so this is the lettuce family, Asteraceae. It is a great one because it's also a perfect flower, but it, it will, um, will cross, or can cross pollinate. Uh, pea family, which beans, as I said earlier, perfect flower, generally self pollinate before they even open. Where's so, the, where's the seed? Where's the seeds on the lettuce? Where's the seeds on the lettuce? So, um, if you're not familiar, the lettuces and a lot of the brassicas, like bok choy and top soy, um, they'll go to seed eventually, which means you'll have this nice looking head, and then one day it'll start growing up, and it'll keep going up and up and up, and in the center, a real thick stalk will form. And you have to kind of wait for the lettuce to run its course, so maybe that's about 60 days, depending on the lettuce variety, somewhere 45 to 60 days before it starts bolting and coming up, and then once it bolts, it's gonna form some little flowers, and then those flowers are gonna turn to seed. That seed's gonna be a dry seed. It's gonna be kind of like a dandelion that flies around, the seed will fly around. Um, and you wanna wait pretty much until it's at that point that you could literally just blow and let the seed fly. Uh, beans going with the dry concept. You know, for me, I wait for my beans till they're really like crispy on the vine, just really uh, like the light brown or, or brown, pretty much brown and dried out the bean itself before I pull them off. And what that means is if you're in a rainy climate, which I am, is I just wait for a sunny day. I wait for a couple sunny days so that it's actually gotten dry on the plant and I don't have to do any extra drying after the fact. Parsley family, umbelliferae, um, which is one of my favorites, little umbrella-shaped flowers, clued celery, dill, carrot, fennel. Uh, carrot's a little tricky for me. Is that, anyone good to go to seed here? Great. So, you know, some people back there are a little higher climates. Um, for me in Haiku, I can't get carrots to go to seed, but the others go to seed pretty readily. And it's a great one because it dries really well just on the flower, and it's a great one for harvesting. You can just literally peel the, peel the seeds off of the plant itself. Um, dill's a great one in my garden. I just broadcast it everywhere. I grab the seed and throw it around to, to replant it. Canopodaceae. Uh, this one, does anyone have to go to seed on the island? Beets or chard? Okay, what elevation are you at? 2,000. 2,000, oh great. You got a rhubarb chard. Uh -huh. A rhubarb chard specifically or all varieties? No, or just, just the one, okay. And what about beets? No. No, yeah. So if we have growers at like 4,000 feet, we'd probably get some, some beet seed, but I'm not sure. Beets 1,800. Oh, beets at 1,800 regularly. Oh, nice. Great to hear. Yeah, so, so we have the ability to produce seed off of, off of pretty much all of these plants. Uh, the mustard family, brassicas, this is getting into a more advanced seed saving thing because they cross pollinate. And it's really important in looking at seed production to look at the genus and the species of plants. So here we have Brassica oleraceae. And what we get to, to have an open pollinated um, seed, or a true seed, so to speak, which is what we want, we need to make sure that uh, plants, flowers, are only pollinated by another plant of the same variety. So what that means is, um, you know, within this species, the Elleraceae, we have broccoli, we have cauliflower, cabbage, and Brussels sprouts, collards, kohlrabi. So if we're growing broccoli for seed, and we have, um, kohlrabi that we're also growing for seed in the same garden, and they cross pollinate, well, we don't know what we're gonna get. We're not gonna get the broccoli we were hoping on. So my solution for that is I'm only planting one, I'm only planting broccoli if I'm gonna save broccoli seed. I'm not gonna plant the other things within that same species. And grass family corn, this one's the most difficult one because of the range at which it will cross pollinate, and it's wind pollinated. Uh, and I don't actually, I think it's a mile or two miles that it can cross pollinate or, or, or more. And I guess in a windy place like we're in, it could be up to you know, five to 10 miles that cross pollination can happen with the strength of the wind, which is where there's a lot of issues related to the growing of genetically modified corn on the island. Because as farmers, if we're trying to save corn seed, uh, it's gonna be challenging with the situation that we're in. 
This is a terrible picture, and it is a seed-saving box. And I'm sharing this, I'm putting this up here because Community Work Day, who's familiar with Community Work Day, the work that they're doing here? But they're the ones who have spearheaded the school garden uh, movement that's taking place right now with all the gardens that are throughout, throughout the island at the schools, and they have a greenhouse that provides all the plants for the school gardens, and they do an immense amount of work towards furthering local agriculture, particularly with the youth, bringing up the next generation so that they're going to step in, step into the role in a big way. And Community Work Day right now is working to pull people together to build seed share boxes throughout the island and place them in, in specific, easy to utilize places throughout the island. And I, I aspire to have one at our meetings too, that when we come, we can all bring seeds. And it could just be a few packets of seeds that you've saved, and you can add them to this collection and, and trade. You know, constantly trade seeds. And what it, it's a great opportunity for us as a community because we're really young in terms of seed saving and a lot of people that don't know necessarily know the proper practices um, and, and what to do. But things like this can allow the community to come together and learn together and grow together. Because I know for me, I spent years on my own on the farm just saving seeds, not knowing what I was doing. And I was planting things and not getting results. And I just didn't have information. I didn't have knowledge. I didn't have community around it, people to connect with. And this is an opportunity for us to come together about, around it so that you know, when I'm making mistakes, I can share it with the other 20 people that are using my seed share box so that 20 of us together can grow and learn and, and step up to a new level. And you know, with, with this in mind, I'm, over, over here on the table, there's the seed catalog from Peaceful Valley. And you know, there's, there's all these seed catalogs that I order a lot of seed from. And I'm just gonna, I just keep wondering, like, when are we gonna have one of these as a community here in Hawaii? And because what, what these companies are doing is, that oftentimes they're not really growing their own seed. They might grow a bunch of their own seed, but they're buying from farmers, individual farmers. So this is a real great opportunity for us to come together as a community. And we could create our own Maui seed catalog or Hawaii seed catalog, or each island could have their own. And you know, if I'm growing a certain kind of lettuce that I really like and I'm saving seed from, I can save extra seed and sell it to our local seed co-op on, the, on these islands. So it's a really great opportunity for us to create more variety, save more seed, localize our agriculture, and specifically you know, get the benefits of locally saved seed that's genetically coded for our soils and our climate and our landscape so that we can be really benefit from that. Because right now, there's a lot of seed varieties I'm planting that are grown on the mainland. You know, they're genetically coded for Missouri or some, somewhere in the Midwest or California, wherever it is. And you know, if we can really come together, we can cooperate and we can create a good model for actually saving seeds together as a community. And this one I threw in there because it is an incredible resource. It's called Seed to Seed, and it's a book by Suzanne Ashworth. And I, and I spent years trying to find the best seed saving book. And for the moment, I believe this is it. And if you're really interested in learning more about seeds, this is the way to go. And right now, this is kind of a really brief overview. And particularly, like, even, even when I go on an in-depth overview, I'm not going to share like, all the um, separation distances, like the distance you have to have plants apart so they don't cross-pollinate, or the, po the minimum population size. Every species and every uh, variety has its own little set of information. And I don't remember all that, and I'd be surprised if anybody does. So I have this little encyclopedia that when it's like, you know, I want to save seed off of my lettuce this year, I go in there and I look up, you know, how far does it have to be away from other lettuce varieties, and how many plants do I need to save off of? So, and, and you know, short of having a book, all this is available online. I could just type in, you know, lettuce population size, and boom, it's going to come up just like that. So really researching and getting more informed on this and sharing the information um, with other people. Going to be really valuable as we grow, grow in this together because seeds are vital to, to our lifeline as farmers um, in the future and in this moment. So thank you, and I'm, I'm open to answering questions if you have any. Depends where you are, you know. I, I, oh, the, the question was: Are there other ways of saving good dry ways of saving seeds besides in the refrigerator? If you're in Kula, you're in a much drier climate, so your, your humidity level is way down. But it's really focusing on that formula of humidity plus temperature. If it's over 100, you're going to want to find an alternative method for storing your seeds. 
So if you're at elevation in the desert, you're going to do a lot better. Where you are, it's, it gets pretty wet. You know, the rain comes down. Where I am in Haiku, the rain really comes down. So it's the best way for me. Um, freezer is another way, another form. I personally don't like to put things in the freezer because I know if I went in the freezer, my seed would not survive. So, um, so it just doesn't make sense to me. But, yeah. Simon. Recently, it had none of them sprout. Oh. If, if who radiates? Um, the male. Oh, the male. I, ha I have no idea. I mean, I've, I've ordered seeds for years, and I've never had that problem. So, okay. yeah, you might have gotten some bunk seeds. Yeah. Uh, Courtney wanted me to mention that there is a Maui Seed Savers group on Facebook. And if you just type in Maui Seed Savers, you'll find it. And if you're interested in learning more about seeds or joining the community that's going to grow this on this island, check it out. Maui Seed Savers on Facebook. I heard of the PR show. Where are they? I don't know where the community was. might have been in Vermont. But they were having seed exchanges at the local library. Mm -hmm. And so the, the seed packets were there at the checkout. People yeah. could just grab Yeah, and even these, uh, uh, the comment was that there's uh, seed exchanges happening at libraries, actually seed libraries. So you can go to the public library and, and trade seeds. And these seed share boxes, I know one of the places they're researching putting them at is the local libraries, and it's a pretty common one. And, and traditionally in this country, is the, the founding, at the foundation of the public library system, seeds were a part of it. Because there was that, that that valuable that valuable community resource, and what's just kind of happened through time is we've lost our varieties. Is that we've lost control of the seed because of how valuable they are. And when we look at all the problems in the world and all these you know challenges that we're up against as farmers, um, seeds are such a great example of an opportunity that we have. That like it's legal to save seeds. We we can save as much seed as we want. And there's challenges with things like corn that can cross pollinate really readily that goes on. But most of these other seeds, it's just up to us to take it on and do it. Uh, question and a comment. First, the question uh, that seed coat image, mm -hmm. did you draw that? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Next. <laughs> uh, the comment is uh, there was a story in the New York Times, actually, it was an op ed piece in the New York Times last month talking about seeds. And it wasn't talking about GMOs, but it was still saying, be careful where your seeds come from. It was talking about how the seed industry uses a lot more pesticides and other chemicals than even the food producers do. And that uh, if you live near any of these commercial seed producers, I'm, ta I'm not talking about small cooperative mm -hmm. things that you're talking about, you know, and that there's wonderful things that way. But some of these large things, you know, you go to the Walmart, you buy a packet of seeds, that may be some of the most sprayed fields imaginable. And so the reason for doing seeds is that much more important. Yeah, so, so the comment is that um, a lot of the seeds that you might buy have been overly sp sprayed with pesticides and fungicides and even chemical fertilizers. And the nicotinoids that are killing the bees. And, and this is going to specifically be for non-organic seeds, yeah. you know, which, which is really an encouragement to purchase organic seeds because not only um, are you going to support organic movement and support seeds that were grown in a clean, healthy environment, but when you're purchasing seeds that are not organic, they were raised in a very specific way. So their genetic coding is they want fungicides, and they want pesticides, and they want chemical fertilizers. So any seed that's non-organic, mo mostly, uh, generally has been raised under these conditions. So not only is it harming the planet, but it, in addition to that, it's coded to practices that you might not be growing. So you might plant that seed and be really susceptible to pests and really susceptible to funguses because the seed has no protection at that point. Yeah. David? Are you familiar with the uh, seed initiative at the Kohala Center on the Big Island? Mm -hmm. Can you yeah. comment on that? Hawaii Public Seed Initiative. Um, that, that they also have a Facebook group, I believe. They have a website, Hawaii Public Seed Initiative. And it's the Kohala Center on the, on the Big Island, and they're doing tremendous seed work. I mean, that's really all there is to comment. So they're really spearheading it for all the islands and have been traveling around doing workshops through all four, four of the major Hawaiian islands to really get a movement going around seas and start sharing knowledge. And that's, that's the biggest thing we can be doing, is sharing knowledge with each other and practicing and keep doing it. Is anybody here, uh, got kale who go to sea? I knew one grower at 4,000 feet. Anyone else? Kale, going to seed? 
Uh, it's, it, it's a tricky one, yeah, I've only known one person at 4,000 feet and it wasn't a ton of plants. I have some fizz kale going to right now. What kind of kale? Fizz. Huh, is it Ethiopian kale, the same? I don't know. Okay, yeah, I don't know either. All right, well, thank you. Have a great night. You got a birthday tomorrow, with it? All right. Well, thank you for sharing your gifts with us tonight. You know, um, our business, we plant about 150 pounds of seeds a week. And uh, just so you know, when we, we freeze some of our seeds to get better germination. And also, if you do refrigerate your seeds, take them out of, when you take them out of the refrigerator, let them get to room temperature before you expose them to the air because moisture will jump on them and then all your seeds will be compromised. Yeah, you're not going to plant all of those. So just a note in that respect. Um, you see these cards here? These are about our meeting. If you want to take some and give them to some of your friends, that would be great. They're over there. Please feel free to grab them. I want to thank everybody tonight, all that presented. I want to thank everyone that brought food. I want to thank all our volunteers. I want to thank... What is that I mean? Huh? Oh yeah, please get your dishes. Don't forget your dishes and bowls. We're going to open up a business with all the dishes and bowls that get left behind. Um, but no, thank you everyone. Please come back again next month. Bring a friend. Let's rock this meeting. Continue to rock it. Let's show our legislators how we roll. Mahalo everybody. Mahalo Tim Wolf, Jim Hall, Neil, all our volunteers. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night. Travel safe.